Hey everyone, Pastor Caleb here from Cross of Life uh, with the first of your Lenten reading devotions. What our congregation is uh, going to do during this Lenten season is read through the Gospel of Luke. And uh, I am hopefully going to give you some devotional thoughts every day uh, along with those readings in order that you don't just read the text, but you're having a chance to meditate on the text and also think about maybe some other things that you might not have noticed in the text right away. My strategy is that I'm going to do everything a day late, and that's not because I'm a procrastinator. (laughs) In fact, for all of my flaws, I'm a procrastinator, which means I generally get things done uh, beforehand, which you maybe notice that I'm generally going to be wearing a lot of the same clothes and a lot of these videos because I'm going to record like 12 of them on one day or something like this. Um, But my hope in doing them a day late for you is that you get the chance to read the text, to meditate on, on it yourself before you get any sort of direction or answers from me on the text. Along with that, if you do come up against something in the text as you're reading through Luke, and I don't answer it in one of my devotional thoughts, um, send me uh, an email. You can go to our website, crossoflife.net, and you can go under the Start Here tab. Under Start Here, you'll find Ask Our Pastor, and that's a question form that goes directly to my email, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have about the text. So my hope is to just paraphrase the text for you. I'm going to walk through it. I'm not going to read it exactly because you've already done that, but I'm going to give you kind of a paraphrase of it. And then I want to give you just a couple devotional thoughts for your meditation today on scripture. So the first reading that was for Ash Wednesday is Luke 1, verses 1 to 38. Luke starts by announcing to most excellent Theophilus, who is the recipient of this gospel, that uh, he has researched all the things that he is about to write about thoroughly, going back to the eyewitnesses and seeing the things that have been fulfilled among him and the other eyewitnesses regarding Jesus Christ. He then jumps into the story about uh, John the Baptist's birth being foretold. Uh, He starts by introducing this man named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. And uh, it says that both of them were righteous people, believers in the Lord, but they had a problem, which was that Elizabeth could not conceive a baby. Uh, One day when Zechariah's division uh, of the priesthood was on its duty, he went into the temple and there the angel of the Lord came to him and uh, started to communicate with him. Of course, he was terrified by this, uh, but the angel said, don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard and Elizabeth is going to bear a son and uh, he is going to be a joy and a delight to you. And he's going to uh, essentially take the Nazarite vow, which was a special vow that the Old Testament people had in order to set themselves apart. He's going to be a a lifelong Nazarite, and his name is going to be John. He's going to go on before the Lord, and he uses this quote that is um, connected to the Old Testament in the spirit and the power of Elijah, which makes him um, a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy about Elijah, that Elijah would come back before the coming of the Messiah. Um, Zechariah asks the angel, well, how can I be sure of this? Um, And he gives the excuse, I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. And the angel doesn't take kindly to this. He says, I'm Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I speak for God. Um, And so then Gabriel says, you're not going to be able to speak until the baby comes. Uh, The people outside were wondering why Zechariah stayed in so long, and they realized that he had had a vision when he came out because he was unable to speak to them. When his time of service was complete, he went home, and uh, Elizabeth became pregnant just as the angel said. Then we get the birth of Jesus foretold. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Gabriel, the same angel who appeared to Zechariah, goes to Galilee to Mary, who is pledged to be married to Joseph, who is in the line of David, just like Mary actually is. Mary was a virgin, um, and the angel came to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Of course, this doesn't uh, exactly happen every day to Mary, so she's a little bit scared by this. But the angel says, don't be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. And he tells her that she is going to have a son who is going to be named Jesus. He is going to be great and the son of the Most High God. And he will take the throne of David, which again was another Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. Mary also asks the angel, well, how is this going to be? Um, Because she's a virgin. And interestingly, and we'll get into this in the devotional points, the angel has a very different reaction to Mary. Um, The angel actually answers with an explanation. The Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the Holy One who will be born to you will be called the Son of God. And then he even gives the example of Elizabeth. Check it out. Elizabeth is having a baby too. For no word from God will ever fail. And Mary closes out this section by acknowledging what the angel says, I am the Lord's servant, may it be to me as uh, you have said. 
And that concludes the uh, first part of Luke chapter one. So a couple devotional thoughts here. First of all, I want us to think for a moment about the place of children in um, the meta narrative of the scripture. Uh, God uses children to answer prayers. Um, and this is a theme that continues to go throughout the scripture. It starts with Seth right at the very beginning of the Bible. Um, that Seth is the one who replaces Abel after Cain, Abel's brother, murders him. Um, we have Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, whose stories are all about having children. Um, we then fast forward a little bit to the time of the judges, uh, the story of maybe like you think of, of uh, Samson. Samson is an answer to prayer. He's a baby who is going to be a deliverer, a judge of God's people. You might think of Samuel the prophet, um, how Hannah, his mother, prayed to God um, in order to have a baby. And Samuel was the answer to that prayer. And then, of course, you have these two examples right here, John and Jesus, two babies who are going to come into the world to be, first of all, the forerunner of the Messiah in John. He's going to be the one who announces this is the Messiah in the spirit and power of Elijah. And then uh, Jesus himself, of course, who is the savior of the world. And the thing for us to think about is the value that God places on children, that God uses children to accomplish his will. Uh, Jesus makes this very plain when he says that the little children are the ones who should come to me and that they should not be hindered. And that if you do not receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you do not receive it. Um, there, of course, are many practical applications to the way we think about uh, sanctity of life issues in the modern day. But I think what all of us ought to just meditate on is the value of children uh, in our lives. Um, even if we don't abort our children or prevent them from coming into the world by some sort of um, unnecessary birth control, uh, children are very quickly treated like uh, problems rather than blessings. And of course, this is not true for everybody. Some people do genuinely love children, but um, very often the rhetoric that I hear is uh, children are, are a real burden. Um, they make my life worse. They make my life harder. Um, that is not how God sees children. In fact, God sees children as a bundle of opportunity to advance his kingdom. And um, that is to some extent because uh, these children, though they are sinful by nature, um, have not been as entrenched in the world like those of us who are older have been. And so they do have the ability to be brought up in the training and instruction of the Lord and be blessings to the next generation. They also are the mark of true wealth. Uh, money is a zero-sum game. In order to get money, you have to take money from somebody else. Uh, status is a zero-sum game. In order to get status, you have to take status from somebody else. Success is a zero-sum game. In order to succeed, somebody else has to fail. Children, people, is true wealth. Because people, of course, do not require you to take something from somebody else in order to have people, because you can have as many babies as your bodies allow. But also, they have the ability to bless numerous people, a number which is not limited in any way. Um, so, uh, one of the things that we ought to just think about is the fact that having children or raising up Christian children is one of the most valuable things that the Christian church can do. Second devotional thought um, is about the answers that Zechariah and Mary give to Gabriel. Uh, so, Gabriel shows up to Zechariah and he gives this prophecy that John is going to be uh, born and he gives this prophecy also to Mary that Jesus is going to be born. And at least on the surface, it seems that Zechariah and Mary have very similar answers and yet get very dissimilar answers. Zechariah gets, uh, becomes mute until the baby is born and, um, and Mary is uh, given an explanation. So what's the deal with this? Uh, it's probably easier to look at if we just zoom in on exactly what the Zechariah and Mary say to the angel. So Zechariah says, how can I be sure of this? How can I be sure of this? In other words, what he says is, I am unsure and I need you to give me more proof, right? Um, I have this excuse that I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. So I need you to give me more proof than what you just said. If you look at what Mary says um, down in verse 34, she says, how will this be? What she's assuming is that it is going to happen. She's just wondering about the method. How is this going to happen? I understand it's going to happen. I'm just curious about how you're going to carry this out. And in that, we see uh, uh, two kind of ways that people come at God. On the one hand, some of us come to God like Zechariah, asking for proof. 
Um, and God simply says to us, you don't need any more proof. As the angel says um, later in the conversation with Mary, no word from God can ever fail. He has given you his word. His word is attested to by hundreds of eyewitnesses, by thousands of years of history, by numerous studies of archaeological evidence, of historical evidence, um, and all that, of course, on top of the fact that he's literally God and he spoke as he was a man on this earth. And so we should take him seriously because he proved his godness by his resurrection from the dead. Um, And yet very often we ask for proof. And of course, this is illogical based on the evidence that God has given us. It's also illogical based on the fact that um, people who are asking God to prove himself are assuming that God is going to play by their rules and that their requests for proof are going to be answered when that does not necessarily uh, constitute how God would give proof if he were going to prove himself to be real. I mean, think about this. God literally showed up in the flesh and a whole bunch of people didn't believe in him. So even some people would say, well, if God would just appear to me, I would believe in him. No, you wouldn't. Um, Literally, people have done that and have not believed in him. Um, So asking God for proof is just not something that what anyone should do, but particularly Christians. Um, we do this thing where we we maybe pray for something and then we expect that God is going to give us some sort of sign or something like this that's going to help us know that our prayer has been answered or that God has heard our prayer. Uh, that's just not how Christians work. God, or Christians go to what God has already said, just like Mary does. How will this be? Um, you have said this thing. I trust that it is true. I am now interested in how it is going to play itself out. And I think particularly in this stage in our world's history, when so many things are uncertain, it is good for Christians to hold on to what God has said absolutely truly and then ask themselves, okay, how is this going to play out? And then spend their time and energy not worrying whether God's actually going to do what he said he's going to do, but worrying about how they can love their neighbor through God accomplishing what he's already going to accomplish. Now, that has a thousand different applications, and if you are thinking of one and you want to ask about it, please send me a note, and I'd be glad to talk about it with you. But for the sake of keeping this devotional time under 15 minutes, um, I want to go down to the very last part of this, and that's the idea of highly favored. Um, When Gabriel comes to Mary, he says, greetings, you who are highly favored. And I think when we hear that in in English, we hear uh, like preference, right? We, We hear God prefers Mary over somebody else. And that's not necessarily wrong, but I think there's a connotation we put into that idea of preference or favor that God doesn't have. And that's the idea of preference because of performance. Um, I prefer certain types of pizza over other types of pizza because they perform better or I just like the taste better. I like certain athletes or certain sports teams because they perform better. I like certain investments or certain stocks because they perform better. Um, In general, human beings prefer things because they perform better. God does not. Um, God does not choose to love somebody or to favor them because of something about themselves, but because of something about him, which is his Uh, unconditional love that he gives to all people, but then particularly gives to specific people for the sake of accomplishing his salvation to the whole world. And in this case, it's very obvious when you look at the Greek text of what uh, the angel says to Mary to understand what God is saying. Uh, Instead of saying highly favored, the word there for favored is literally the Greek word for grace, which we describe uh, shorthand as undeserved love. Greetings, you who have been highly, undeservedly loved. And really, in this sense, Mary is not favored. She receives the same grace, the forgiveness of her sins that you and I receive. Of course, she didn't deserve it. She was a sinful by nature human being who also had sinned in her life. She was not perfect. Um, And yet she received grace from God. Um, And the same thing is true for you. You are highly favored. You are highly graced. You are highly undeservedly loved. Not because you are good, not because you are performing, but because God is good and Jesus has performed in your place. And so you are free to say, I don't know what my life will hold, but I know that God knows best. And that is exactly what Mary did. And so I pray that for you. You are free, brothers and sisters, to live in the grace that God has shown to you. 
You do not need to perform. You do not need to pull it off. You do not need to be acknowledged. You do not need to be somebody. You are free from all of those shackles, all of those demands of the world. You are free to know that the God of all, of, over all the universe loves you immensely and was willing to send his son in the womb of the Virgin Mary so that you could be saved, so that you could live. So greetings to all you who are highly favored. And I look forward to studying with you again for some devotional time tomorrow. If you're enjoying this content, make sure you share it with other people, particularly in our church, but maybe if you find somebody else that you want to share it to share it with, I encourage you to do that as well. God bless your day and I'll see you tomorrow.